So this is uh, the second part of the anatomy of uh, the heart. And uh, to begin, I would like uh, to trace the blood flow through uh, the heart. Now, um, in these animations, and we'll go to a frontal section in just a second, uh, notice that some of the blood is depicted as being blue, some of the blood is depicted as being red. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but only a bit, uh, because uh, many molecules do change uh, their hue uh, based on uh, which uh, molecules then bind them. And hemoglobin can bind oxygen, and it can then release oxygen and bind carbon dioxide instead. And this does change the hue of the blood. So for example, many students, when they study uh, you know, blood pressure readings and the blood pressure cuff, uh, you know, might talk about uh, cyanotic uh, situations where an area has a venous congestion and the area is becoming more of a purplish blue. So even superficially on someone's you know, uh, skin, uh, very often one can determine, distinguish between blood which is oxygenated versus um, deoxygenated. And so um, as we trace blood through the heart, then some of the blood will be red as it uh, goes, uh, if it is oxygenated or uh, blue or purple, if it is uh, deoxygenated. And so um, first thing is before we can talk about uh, the chambers, valves, and vessels in heart anatomy. We should get an idea of uh, how blood flows through the heart. Uh, otherwise, much of what I'm about to say won't uh, make sense. So uh, right now, your brain is receiving uh, blood with oxygen. So your, your brain gets this oxygenated blood as does your hand, your foot, and uh, the oxygen then leaves, and then the blood becomes deoxygenated and more of a purplish blue. Your brain, your hand, your foot, they no longer want this blood to the same uh, degree. And so this blood then leaves these tissues and enters veins. The veins start fusing, they get bigger and bigger until they form these very large veins, which come back bringing deoxygenated blood to the heart. The superior vena cava, this vessel here, is bringing the blue deoxygenated blood from the upper part of the body. The inferior vena cava is bringing the deoxygenated blood from the inferior part of the body. And as was discussed in the previous video, there's also a coronary sinus, which then um, brings the deoxygenated blood from the heart itself. So the coronary sinus, the superior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava, they all bring deoxygenated blood, the blood that none of the body parts want anymore, back to the heart. But out of the four chambers, there is a right atrium, a left atrium, a right ventricle, a left ventricle. This deoxygenated blood is brought back to only one of the chambers, the right atrium. So the right atrium uh, receives the purplish blue uh, blood coming back from the hand, the foot, uh, uh, the brain, and uh, the rest of the body system. Uh, the right atrium will send blood to the right ventricle. And then when the right ventricle squeezes, this blood then leaves through a pulmonary trunk into left and right pulmonary arteries. Now, this blood is leaving the heart, but it does not go to the brain and back to the hand and back to the foot and back. And the reason for that is the brain, the hand, the foot just got rid of this blood. They didn't want it anymore. They want red oxygenated blood, not this blue deoxygenated blood. And so if we're going to make this blood red and oxygenated, there's only one part of the body we can send it to. That is why this is called the pulmonary trunk, and these are called the pulmonary arteries because this blood is heading towards the lungs. So the right ventricle squeezes blood, and it then goes uh, to uh, the lungs. And in the lungs, gas exchange occurs, and then the, red be the blood becomes oxygenated. That will be covered uh, to a greater de uh, detail in uh, the chapter on the respiratory system. This red oxygenated blood has to come back to the heart, so the heart can send it to the body parts that want it. And so uh, from each lung, there are two, uh, there's a pair of pulmonary veins. These pulmonary veins then return the red oxygenated blood to the heart, and the pulmonary veins enter into the left atrium, the left atrium will then squeeze this red oxygenated blood to the left ventricle. And this left ventricle will now then squeeze 
uh, this uh, blood into the arch of the aorta, from uh, which point it will go to the brain and back, to the hand and back, to the foot and back, to the body systems and uh, back. And these then systems will get the, the red oxygenated blood uh, that uh, they need. Okay, and so um, gas exchange uh, occurs. Um, and we can talk about this uh, again, you know, later and in other chapters. Um, but for example, it's red blood, which is being sent to the brain, the hand, and the foot. And when this gets to the capillaries in the brain, the hand, and the foot, oxygen leaves, carbon dioxide enters. And so while red oxygenated blood is delivered to these tissues, it is then blue deoxygenated blood, which then enters the veins. So this is the blood that these systems no longer want. It enters the veins, and from there it can go into the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, um, and the coronary sinus. Uh, and then from the right atrium is sent to the right ventricle. The right ventricle sends this blue blood to the lungs. Um, there are capillaries in the lungs. Uh, the capillaries in the lungs, they receive blue deoxygenated blood. But in the lungs, gas exchange occurs. Oxygen enters the blood, uh, carbon dioxide enters the air sac so it can be exhaled. And so then as it passes through the capillaries of the lungs, this blood becomes red and oxygenated and then returns uh, to the um, and, and then returns to the left uh, atrium. Now I may uh, go to a, a still um, of, uh, uh, of these in a PowerPoint uh, a presentation. Um, uh, I may just stay here as well. Uh, but uh, so my students know, um, if you were then going to dissect uh, uh, beef hearts, I have a video, uh, actually I have a couple of videos that go through uh, the dissection of you know, beef hearts and, and all of the parts uh, being labeled. I don't know not going there. Um, and so uh, this will be a, a quick uh, you know, overview of them. But once again, if this was something you were focusing on in lab, these videos cover this uh, to, uh, uh, to a greater uh, degree. So um, now that we know um, how blood flows through the heart, it's now easy to identify the chambers of the heart. Remember, there are four chambers. There are two atria, left and right, and there are uh, two uh, ventricles, uh, left and uh, right. And the, um, and the way that one can distinguish, come on. this should clear up in just a second, we're hoping. Um, the way that uh, one can uh, distinguish is that uh, and so as uh, one looks at the chambers, a couple of things are evident. Um, here's an atrium. Look at how thin the atrial wall is. This is the left atrium. Um, the left atrium has such a thin wall because where is the atrium sending blood? To the ventricle. The ventricle is just underneath it. So it doesn't take a whole lot of muscular contraction to pump blood a couple of inches. And so therefore this wall is rather um, thin because it doesn't have to squeeze very hard. Atria are sending blood into the ventricles beneath them. The left atrium sends blood into the left uh, ventricle. The uh, right atrium sends blood uh, to uh, the right um, uh, ventricle. Um, the ventricles, they have to do more work. They pump um, blood away from the heart uh, and back. And so notice all of this muscle here in the wall of uh, the ventricle, it has to be thicker. Now of the two, uh, it's easy to see the left ventricle because it has the thickest wall. I'm not sure why the focus isn't coming in as it should. Um, so the left ventricle has the thickest wall and it makes up the apex of the heart. This right ventricle, it has a thicker wall than an atrium. So here you can see the atrium, here's an atrium, Notice that the right ventricle has a thicker wall than an atrium um, because it's pumping blood to the lungs and back, um, but it does not have as thick a wall as the left ventricle. And so the goal is, if you were trying to identify the chambers, to then look for which chamber has the thickest wall and which makes up the apex of the heart. Um, that's the left ventricle. 
Once you identify the left ventricle, the atrium above it is the left atrium. The other ventricle must be the right ventricle. And then the atrium above that must be the right atrium. And so once again, it's pretty easy to identify the chambers of the heart as long as you uh, look for which chamber has the thickest wall and makes up the apex of uh, the heart. That's the left ventricle and everything else should fall into place. Now, what you don't want to do is say, aha, I'm looking at a heart, you know, either a model of a human heart or a beef heart, and this one's on my left, it must be the left ventricle. Because as you can see, if you take a heart and do a frontal section and then do this, on one of the two halves, the left ventricle is on the left. But on the other half, the left ventricle is on the right. So it is not the left ventricle because it is on the left, as you look at it in your dissection tray. It is the left ventricle because it's the left ventricle meaning it has the thickest wall and it makes the apex of the heart. So once again, that's how you are going uh, to um, identify uh, uh, the uh, left uh, ventricle. Um, once you identify uh, the uh, left uh, ventricle, uh, then everything else should kind of fall uh, into uh, place. Um, and so actually, I'm sorry, we'll come back to this one. Um, and so uh, in addition to the four chambers of the heart, you want to identify the four valves. But if you know the chambers, then uh, identifying uh, the heart uh, valves uh, should uh, be easy enough, all right? So um, the heart has these uh, valves, and we'll get back to the, the deep heart in a second. Um, and the reason for that is uh, there is a correct way for blood to travel through the heart, an appropriate way. So blood is supposed to go from an atrium into a ventricle and from a ventricle into the vessel which leaves the ventricle. So from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, uh, from the aorta, uh, from the left ventricle into the aorta. That's how blood is supposed to go. However, at moments of the cardiac cycle, which we'll study in the next part of the chapter, um, blood is tempted to go the wrong way. It's tempted to go from a ventricle into an atrium, that's the wrong way, or go from a vessel back into the ventricle, that's the wrong way. We have to stop blood from going the wrong way, and that's why there are heart valves. Heart valves stop blood from going the wrong way. There are two kinds of valves. One kind of valve has an atrium above it and a ventricle beneath it, and is known as an atrioventricular valve. So you can identify these because they, these valves have an atrium above it. But they also have these rope-like chordae tendinini attached to them, these anchored into loops of muscle muscles. Only the AV valves have them. And so if you were to look at a heart, um, if you say, oh, look, there's an atrium above it, and it has these chordae tendinini, here's an atrium above it, it has chordae tendinini, then obviously it is uh, an AV valve. Now, you can call this the right AV valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and this is the left AV valve. This one has three cusps, so it can also be called the tricuspid. This one has two cusps, so it can also be called the bicuspid. This one also goes by the name mitral valve, so mitral valve prolapse is that this valve is too high, it is prolapsed. Um, and once again, just because the heart is so important and, and medicine is practiced all over the world, um, there are just multiple names which have come into common uh, usage. So um, atrioventricular valves, they separate an atrium and a ventricle. Um, as we will see, they open when blood tries to go the right way from the atrium into the ventricle, and they will close when um, blood tries to go the wrong way from the ventricle uh, back into the atrium. There are two other valves called semilunar valves that are different, right? So here's a semilunar valve, here's a semilunar valve. They are different because they don't have an atrium above them. They instead have the pulmonary trunk or the, the aorta. And the, their valve flaps do not have these chordae tendinini uh, attached to them. So it's easy to see the difference. The pulmonary semilunar valve, this is at the base of the pulmonary trunk. And the aortic semilunar valve, this is at the base of the aorta. Uh, and so uh, these valves open when blood is trying to go the right way from the ventricle into the vessel, but they close 
when blood is trying to go uh, the wrong way from the vessel back into uh, the ventricle. Now, what I'm about to um, uh, to say, uh, this may not make you know a hundred percent sense yet, um, but we'll go through it again with the cardiac cycle in the next video. Um, just some basic principles uh, here. So, valves open and close because of pressure. We don't have muscles which pull on them to close them. If a valve opens or closes, it's because of pressure. When a new cardiac cycle is beginning, the atria are filled and the ventricles are empty. And so the pressure is pushing against um, the atrioventricular valve from the atrial side. And the valves are constructed in such a way that they will open when there's a high pressure in the atria and a lower pressure in the ventricles. So when blood tries to go the right way, we want blood to go from the atrium into the ventricles, these valves open. So valves open because of pressure, and the pressure in the atrium is higher than the pressure in the ventricles. The valves open and thus uh, blood can go from the atrium into the ventricles. Then, however, later in the cardiac cycle, as we will see, the atria are empty, and now the ventricles start to squeeze. And so now this changes everything because now the um, high pressure is in the ventricles and the low pressure is in the uh, atrium. And so now when blood tries to go the wrong way, it would go from this full uh, ventricle into this empty atrium, but uh, it's like pushing on a door. So you can push on the door one way to open, but if you were to then push on the opposite side, that would close it. And so when we push on the door from the ventricle side, that pushes these valves close. Now they only close so far and go then flush because these chordae tendinity will hold them. All right, that's why this doesn't, you know, keep on going and flap around here, letting, um, you know, blood uh, escape. So when blood tries to go the wrong way because there's a high pressure in the ventricle and a low pressure in the atria, that is what will cause the valve to, uh, to close. Now, as we will see in the next uh, video, that will cause the um, blood to swirl around. There will be turbulence and that will actually make a heart sound. So when we listen to the heart, we'll talk about this in the next video, we hear lubbed up, lubbed up. The first heart sound, the lub, is the turbulence in the blood uh, when the AV valves uh, close. Okay, so uh, the atrioventricular valves, they open and close because of pressure. At no point do muscles, they pull them uh, close. They open when blood is trying to go the right way into the ventricles. They close when blood is trying to go the wrong way back into the atrium. And then the same thing applies to the semilunar valves. They will open when blood is trying to go the right way. So we want blood to leave the ventricles and go into these vessels. And so when the ventricles are squeezing and squeezing, there's a moment where there's a high pressure here. So when the high pressure is in the ventricles and the low pressure is in the vessels, that is when the semilunar valves will open and allow blood uh, to leave. So uh, blood is going to be uh, ejected. There's ventricular ejection. However, after a while, the ventricles stop squeezing. And now we have all this blood in the vessels. That's where the high pressure is. The ventricles are uh, relatively empty um, and they're not squeezing anymore. That's where the low pressure is. And so now this blood would be tempted to go back from an area of high pressure to low. But that is when the semilunar valves will close. So once again, it is pressure that uh, opens and closes uh, these uh, valves. Valves open when blood is being pushed to go in the right direction, the appropriate direction. Um, the uh, valves uh, close uh, when pressure is pushing uh, blood to go in the wrong uh, direction. Um, if you were looking on a heart model or if you were dissecting uh, a, uh, a beef heart, um, you would certainly you know, ask, you know, what kind of valve is this? And the AV valves are, um, oops, uh, are easier to uh, identify. Um, so uh, notice, here's the left ventricle, there's the left uh, atrium, all right? So, um, and then notice that there are valves that have these chordae tendinity. Let's go to, a, I'll, I'll pause. So, um, here you can see 
This is the left ventricle. It has the thickest wall, makes up the apex of the heart. Here's an atrium. So here's a valve. There's an atrium above it. And look at these rope-like chordae tendinity. So that must be uh, the left AV valve separating the left atrium and the left uh, ventricle. Um, so here you can see, here's the left ventricle, here's the left atrium, and then here you see this thick rope-like chordae tendinity. So this must be the left atrioventricular valve, and there are two cusps here. That is the um, bicuspid uh, valve. And then in, um, uh, okay, we'll see the, the right AV valve in a second. Uh, and so, um, here I'm still doing the left AV valve. So if we were to then uh, pull a, a, apart the right ventricle, so there's the right ventricle wall, here's the right atrium. Um, so here's the big empty atrium, and notice then there are three cusps, one, two, and three. And notice that I have these rope-like chordae tendinity attached uh, to them. So this is an AV valve because it has an atrium above it, and it has these rope-like chordae tendinity. It is the right AV valve because that's the right atrium and, um, uh, and uh, ventricle. Now, in contrast, if you were asked what valve is that, all right, and I'm going to go to uh, the PowerPoint uh, for just uh, a second, um, you would then notice it doesn't have an atrium uh, above it. Uh, it doesn't have um, and those chordae tendinity. And so if you were, you know, dissecting this as a sheep heart, um, then you say, all right, so here we have the left ventricle, there's the uh, apex of the heart, here's the right ventricle. All right, so then you would say, all right, so this is the left ventricle, here's the left atrium, see how thin that wall is. Here's the atrium and here's a valve. Notice these rope-like chordae tendinity. So this is obviously an AV valve because it has an atrium above it and rope-like chordae tendinity. Um, and because this is the left atrium and the left uh, ventricle, uh, that would be the left uh, AV valve. Um, if you were to look on the right side, you would see that separating the right atrium and the right ventricle is a valve with three cusps, one, two, three. Also notice those ro that rope-like uh, chordae uh, tendinity. Um, now, if you were ever asked what valve is this, you know, most students would say, I don't know, I didn't even know it was a valve. Um, but then if it's a valve, well, it doesn't have an atrium above it. The atrium's over here, that's a vessel, the aorta uh, specifically. And it doesn't have those chordae tendinity, so that must be, um, so they're over here. So this is a, must be a semilunar valve, one that doesn't have an atrium above it and the chordae tendinity. So therefore, it must be the semilunar valve which separates the left ventricle from the aorta. It must be the aortic semilunar valve. The pulmonary semilunar valve is a little harder to find. You kind of have to cut along the wall of the right ventricle, uh, right to where uh, the base of the heart is. Um, but notice that the chordae tendinity are over here. The atrium is over here. This has no atrium above it, and it certainly doesn't have chordae tendinity. So it is a semilunar valve. And because it's coming out of the right ventricle, it is the pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay. Um, finally, in identifying the heart, the last big group, and so for example, when I, I you know, quiz my students, there are three layers of the heart they need to know. There are four chambers, there are four valves, there are four great vessels of the heart. So, you know, I call them the big 12. And then there are a few other, you know, structures as well. Um, but you know, in addition to the four chambers, the four valves, there are also then four vessels. Um, and by four vessels, uh, you know, that would include the two vena cava. So there's a superior vena cava, which brings deoxygenated blood into um, the right atrium from the superior part of the body. There's an inferior vena cava. The coronary sinus brings blood here as well. And then coming out of the uh, right ventricle is the pulmonary trunk which branches into pulmonary arteries, all right? And so um, we have the superior and inferior vena cava, the pulmonary trunk, and the pulmonary arteries. So this transports the blue deoxygenated blood, and we send it to the lungs, 
And then after it becomes oxygenated in the blood, in the lungs, uh, the blood comes back through uh, the uh, pairs of pulmonary veins, all right? And so thus from the lungs, oxygenated blood returns to the left atrium of the heart, once again, through these pulmonary uh, veins. And then uh, after the left atrium uh, sends blood to the left ventricle, uh, the oxygenated blood is pumped then into this big arch of the uh, aorta. Uh, in the, uh, the beef hearts, um, uh, it's a mess um, because obviously one cow can vary from another. It can obviously vary where it is cut from the cow. Um, and so uh, if you look at a cow great vessel, um, it's very hard to identify. Um, unless you look at where the, the chamber uh, or the vessel is going. And so if there's a probe that goes through this great vessel, so if you were to look on the surface of the heart, what is that hole? What is that hole over there? You know, I, I don't know. And even, you know, the aorta starts to branch. It's easy to get it wrong looking at it this way. So don't do that. Instead, look at where the uh, vessel goes. So a vessel that goes into the right atrium is a vena cava. All right, so for example, once again, when I ask my students, if I were to ask this way, don't look at the vessel, all right? So just look at where it goes. It's going into the right atrium. That's a vena uh, cava. And thus, you know, you can be, kind of protect yourself from, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, it's cut from, you know, the cow. And then, uh, uh, and so uh, here you can see then that third opening, uh, the coronary sinus uh, as well. So there are three separate uh, openings here. Uh, it is kind of hard to find that pulmonary trunk. You kind of have to cut along the wall of the right ventricle all the way into, you know, where uh, it meets the base of the heart. All right. And, but if you were to look on the outside, what is that? You know, it's easy to say, I don't know. Um, so don't look at it. Just look at where it goes. It goes into the right ventricle, but it does not, um, it does not pass through the right atrium. So it must be the pulmonary trunk. These vessels are coming into the left atrium, all right? Um, so anything coming into the left atrium must be a pulmonary vein, all right? And then this last one is leaving the left ventricle, but it does not pass through the uh, left atrium. So it must be the aorta. And so if you were uh, uh, trying to identify these vessels on an actual heart, if you look at the vessels themselves, it's easy to get it wrong. So don't look at the vessel, look at where it goes instead, all right? Because the only thing that's coming into the left ventricle that doesn't go through the left atrium is the uh, aorta. So that is not necessarily as hard as uh, it might seem. Now, um, very often I ask then um, my uh, students, all right, so which type of vessels have red oxygenated blood, arteries or veins? And very often they'll say arteries, and then I'll say you're half right, all right? Because, um, and let me just show this one slide. So this next slide is of an opossum uh, heart, um, but it very clearly um, uh, shows, I swear. So when you look at this opossum heart, you can clearly see there that the heart is doing two things. It has two halves. Here's the left ventricle. Here's the right ventricle, and they are split by this interventricular uh, uh, septum. The interventricular septum separate, separates the two ventricles. Notice there's blue blood here and red blood uh, there. And so therefore, if you were to ask which vessels are sending you know, red blood or uh, blue blood, it depends because the heart is doing two things. You just saw it. You know, what the right half is doing is different from the left half is doing. One of the things that the heart does is it pumps blood through a pulmonary circuit to the lungs and back. So starting in the right ventricle, blue deoxygenated blood is pumped to the lungs through the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries. Here in the pulmonary capillaries, gas exchange occurs, the blood becomes red and oxygenated, and then the oxygenated blood returns then through pulmonary veins. So notice that in this loop, what we call the pulmonary circuit, the loop where the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs and back. In this loop, 
the arteries have the blue blood, the deoxygenated blood, and the pulmonary veins have the red oxygenated blood. And so it's a trick question if you would ask, you know, arteries, veins, do they carry oxygen or deoxygen? It depends on which circuit you're talking about. In the pulmonary circuit, the right ventricle is the pump, and the arteries contain the blue deoxygenated blood, the veins contain the red oxygenated uh, blood. In contrast, the systemic circuit, um, in the systemic circuit, the left ventricle is the pump, and it's pumping red oxygenated blood to the body systems and back. In the systemic circuit, it is the arteries which carry the red oxygenated blood. Gas exchange occurs in the systemic capillaries where oxygen leaves, and then it is the systemic veins where the blue deoxygenated blood is returned to the heart. So once again, the heart is doing two things. It has two circuits, all right? The left ventricle is the pump of the systemic circuit. The right ventricle is the pump of the pulmonary circuit. In the pulmonary circuit, blood is being pumped to the lungs and back with the deoxygenated blood in the arteries and the oxygenated blood in the veins. In the systemic circuit, the left ventricle is pumping blood to the body systems and back and the oxygenated blood is in the arteries and the deoxygenated blood is in uh, the veins. Um, and so as uh, you know, we begin uh, this um, uh, chapter, it starts off with anatomy. You know, as we talk about anatomy and physiology, we typically start with the anatomy. And so this first part had a lot of naming. Now, how all of this uh, works in the, um, in the cardiac cycle. That is then uh, what the next part of the chapter uh, uh, does. Um, but before I you know, go in, just let me repeat something from the previous uh, video. Uh, there is blood in the uh, chambers of the heart, but that's not where the heart's blood supply is coming from. All right, so this muscle of the heart, it's just too thick. All right, it can't get uh, oxygen or glucose from diffusion. And so if you were to look at heart muscle under the microscope, you see how rich it is in blood vessels. There's a whole lot of blood vessels, of coronary arteries and veins, their arterioles, their capillary beds, um, uh, et cetera. And so there's a very rich um, blood supply in the heart. This is where the heart is getting its oxygen, its glucose, et cetera, not from diffusion from blood that happens to be in the uh, heart. As such, we don't want those um, blood vessels uh, then uh, to develop lipid plaques, uh, for clots to get lodged there, um, because there is where the gas exchange uh, occurs with the cardiac muscle. And if you were to block blood flow through those coronary blood vessels, then uh, cardiac muscle will die. So this over here is cardiac muscle. That's what your myocardium is supposed to have. But if the blood flow to these muscle cells is blocked, they die and now you have a hole. Right now you don't want a hole. So you, know, you stitch it together and that's better. You know, it's to stitch this together with collagen that's better than having you know, a hole where these you know, cells once were. Um, uh, so we have scar tissue. You know, once again, stitching you know, this area together is better than not. Um, but still, uh, notice that this uh, scar tissue then lacks the muscles which are here. So it's the scar tissue. It doesn't now have the properties of the original tissue. It's primarily just column, you know, uh, holding uh, the area. So unlike smooth muscle, which repairs itself rather, so now it is simply now scar tissue, which takes place. So the anatomy of the heart,